I gotta put all right slides up here and so this is uh this is our session three which uh which we've titled uh towards a pedagogy of open science we often talk about open and open pedagogy and then we talk about open science and i'm trying to bring those two things together what does it mean to teach about open science not just talking about science as scientists, as practitioners of science, as those that are in research labs and collecting data and doing science, although we'll talk about that world. But those of us that teach about science, obviously we're connected to what happens in the world of science. And so anyway, um, I'm sure many of you are already familiar with what open science is, like being completely transparent with your methodology, uh, putting data out there for the public, maybe putting it out on a website somewhere where everybody can see it, maybe using one of these um, platforms that exist for you to be able to share your data and your methods and everything from the original hypothesis formation to what your methodology is, to your data when you collect it, to your final results, your discussion, your paper is open access, this idea of full transparency. And obviously there's a lot of things in between there. Um, so the idea that data is not just uh, available to see, but that it's in kind of an inoperable, reusable form, so other people could analyze it and use it in some way. Um, that your communications, again, whether they're publications like open access, that that should be public, transparent. People should be able to be involved in the review process. Um, and uh, using obviously web-based tools to try to facilitate scientific collaboration and communication. Okay, so th those are a simple way of defining open science. Probably if those of you that are involved in it could probably add to the this definition. I just, I took this from a, a, a source where I think is pretty good summary of what open science is. Um, and then, uh, I don't know why I had that last, what is it? <laughs> um, but um, and then, then the question is like, why do it? Like, why would we do this? What are the, what are the good things about it? And so what, what I wanna do is sort of talk about what the arguments have been for why open science could be a good thing. And then we'll move to talking about what are some of the drawbacks? What are the pitfalls? What are the, what are the problems? What are the critiques? Like no, nothing comes with a full, you know, <laughs> idea that this is going to be great and save the day and everything would be wonderful. Um, I think open science really moved more into the limelight during uh, the pandemic because of the fact that there was a lot of need to share data quickly in order to develop vaccines. And so obviously a lot of controversy around vaccine development, but it was kind of a testament to the fact that um, if you share your results and if the, if the goal is public health and to really try to make sure that everybody can have whatever they need to be healthy, that sharing data and information in order to benefit the public, that, that, that is the ideal. You know, do we achieve this? Did we achieve this to, to some extent during the pandemic? It did help to accelerate the development of vaccines, maybe not always the distribution of vaccines. Um, and this, this article is arguing that you can help uh, accelerate um, research and protect populations in low-income countries. Again, a lot of uh, plus and minus around whether that actually achieved that. Um, and so I have, I have a long laundry list of why to do science openly. And I know we're gonna share these slides for anybody that wants them. I just put a lot of text on my slides today just so people would have that stuff for later. Um, so, you know, the idea that science right now is pretty slow, it can be wasteful, it's locked away, um, it's ruled by commercial interests instead of really interests for the public. Um, there's a reproducibility crisis. People put stuff out there and how do you know whether it's actually valid or reproducible? Uh, research practices themselves can be kind of questionable when they're done behind closed doors. Um, the idea that if you include others that you can extend the range and the extent of your knowledge. Um, this phrase, it's, it's a phrase that I really love, the idea of amplifying collective intelligence, like in its ideal, what a wonderful idea, increasing cognitive diversity. Like if we could actually achieve this, and I, I don't know that we're doing that with open science, but in the ideal to be able to take the diversity of thoughts, ideas, and experiences and, and use that to 
help the public good in some way. Um, the idea is that real breakthroughs in science, they, they don't come through individual superstars, they come through diverse teams that share information. Um, there's a decline in funding for basic science right now and, and more corporatization of academia, decreasing public trust in science because it's felt that it's just for benefiting the few and corporates corporations are the ones that benefit, not people, which leads to decrease in trust, including not trusting vaccines and other kinds of trust issues that are, you know, rightfully placed a lot of the times. Um, sharing data openly can promote higher quality, high quality data, you know, the idea that there's more eyes watching it. Um, the idea of being able to have um, meta-analysis, a small college that can't have access to a big data set, could maybe have access to these data sets if everybody's sharing their data around the country or around the world. Um, it should, in theory, make scientific practice more effective by promoting interdisciplinarity, collaboration of work across all kinds of borders, including physical borders, across countries, other kinds of borders that you might imagine. Again, these are ideals. Um, open research could lead to more effective research uh, practice and breakthroughs. Maybe that's a little repetitive. Um, people who publish openly are cited more frequently. So it's a way of thinking uh, about some individual benefit that you might get from doing your own science openly. Um, students expect things to be open and free, <laughs> which is, you know, uh, 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 something to, to think of whether that's true or not, or whether that drives our work or not. Openness can be the sunlight that helps identify unethical behavior. Um, increasing transparency of the review process, um, moving science away from being dominated by commercial interests. So this is a long laundry list. There's probably more, maybe you can think of others. And again, to the extent to which any of these actually come to fruition is of, of debate for sure. And, um, but, but the idea of trying to move towards this, to be able to do this, um, and I forgot to add, increase public trust of science and scientists um, is, is a goal for open science. Um, and there are places like open lab notebooks where you can go right now and see people that are sharing their data, sharing their stuff that's going on in the research labs. You can find out what they're doing. They'll put ideas out there. Um, there are other platforms. This is just one example. It's, it's a big one. It's well known. Um, but, you know, as I mentioned, open science, it, it's no panacea. When you talk about open education generally, it's not a panacea. It's all in how we leverage it. How are people leveraging it? What can we do about it? And th th that's kind of what I want to talk about today. But some of the problems that can happen is like, um, there's still people doing the labor of science. So how are people compensated? Who gets compensated? When are they compensated? Um, can open science actually exacerbate our current systemic in inequalities? And um, that one paper that we put up as a pre-reading kind of gets at this. And I'm going to talk more about the ways in which that can be true. You know, the idea is that it's supposed to do the opposite, but maybe it doesn't. Um, abuse of women scholars of color. If, if, if folks are putting their data out there free for anybody to use, you know, will it be used appropriately? Will people be taken advantage of? Um, it seems like that that is a fair worry for sure. Um, you can be very vulnerable if you put data out there that you is afraid is not good enough, or someone can say, oh, you didn't really do your project of high quality. So you're making yourself vulnerable to critique, to say, oh, this isn't, this isn't good enough. Um, Open data can certainly be used to invade privacy, take away rights, oppress others. Um, and it's, it's, it's tricky. You know, those of us in the open world often talk about how open is not the opposite of privacy, but how we enact that is, it can be very challenging. Um, protected species and species that have economic value, protection for vulnerable populations and areas. Like if I know of a very, um, exclusive area where there's an endangered species in a particular part of a forest in a particular country somewhere, and I put that out there, it could be that someone will go and collect that and, you know, could be a threat to that species because now other people know about it. Um, open data can jeopardize data sovereignty, especially for indigenous peoples. Um, and the 
the, the hesitancy of sharing your information and your knowledge and data is like um, obviously a huge, huge problem and concern. Um, subjects for which timeliness matters and money may drive competitiveness in, in these areas, right? So there's ways in which if, you, if you're if you quick and you get published and you're gonna get some kind of recognition, um, openness may not work out that well for you. Needing to hold practitioners accountable to IRB standards may be more difficult. Human subjects research in, in open research projects if there's not more of a process in place. Um, high impact journals provide a vetted collection of research, which reduces the amount to look through. So we're saying if you don't have this, maybe that's a problem. Again, is it, isn't it? Um, Preprints can be an anything goes environment. Um, there's a lot of labor that goes into sorting through and evaluating the quality. So that may be a drawback. Um, undergrads can't work as fast as a postdoc, so students might get scooped. Uh, again, all of these are uh, possible drawbacks, not an exhaustive list. A lot of the major complaints, problems, critiques um, associated with open science. Um, and uh, Karen, real quick, yeah, please. I'm, sh I'm sure the answer is yes, but um, has anybody written uh, like? a paper or something that sort of takes that same list you generated and says, okay, here's the problem, we recognize it, here's how we handle it in the open ecosystem. Um, I think there's not one paper that does that, but I okay. think there are a variety of papers that are trying to look at the different pieces because there's a lot there, right? There's a lot of different parts to what openness in science can be about and potential solutions. You know, it's a lot, it's a lot easier to point out the potential problems than the than the solutions. But there are um there are some possibilities that are that are out there for some of for some of these pieces. And I'm not necessarily an expert in all of them, that's for sure. Like the ways in which, for example, um data sovereignty for indigenous nations, there are traditional knowledge licenses. Are there alternative licenses that help protect rights and allow some use, but not other uses so that you can put your data and make it out available so people know what you're doing, but also it protects you in, in different ways. So that's kind of a, 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 a simple answer to one piece of, of, the, of the puzzle here. Um, this, uh, and, and this article that we had put on the, as a reading list that you may or may not have had a, a chance to look at really, really talks about how, um, you know, if you just by making processes open doesn't necessarily drive the rewide, uh, the use of or uh, participation, right, and drive re wide reuse or participation, like saying, um, oh, I'm going to put all my data out there, I'm going to put everything, but, but if I don't have the capacity to do that, right, like I don't have the money, I don't have the cyber infrastructure to do that. We don't have financial resources. We don't have techno. So who gets to put their data out there? The people that already have the resources, right? Who gets to publish in open access journals by paying for that? Because a lot of journals will, you can make it open access if it's paid by author. So who gets to make their work open are the people that have the money and the resources already. And this paper uh, talking about cumulative advantage is the idea that if we're, if we're not careful, the advantage can be even more advantage, right? The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Like open science could just exacerbate those inequities because those that have the access and the ability and can even take some of the risks around putting their data out there. Um, so the idea of, of increasing inclusivity with open science could have an opposite effect via this process of cumulative advantage. Those that already have the resources and the ability to make their stuff open maybe the ones that get the most benefit from it. And it, it's something to keep keep in mind. Um, but but I, I wanna talk a little bit about like, you know, that not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Like, yeah, there's so many problems with open science and there's like, can we not do it? Is, is it that any of these possible benefits are something that we should give up on? Um, and, I, and I think a lot of this goes back to what is our culture of science? You know, what is it that we think about what science is? What is good science? 
What is science that serves the public? What is science that is there for humanity and not for individual benefit or corporate benefit? And th this other publication talks about this disconnect between like what's good for scientists isn't necessarily good for science. So if I'm a young budding science student and a, as an undergraduate at an institution, maybe I'm in a community college or maybe I make it into graduate school eventually, like what am I being told? Well, you have to have original ideas. You have to not share your data with others. You have to be competitive. You have to worry about not being scooped. You have to have something novel. Your results can't just be repetitious of somebody else's stuff. You need to have results that are not just negative. You know, So those things that drive the career development for a scientist can be in opposite or at odds with what we need to know in order to learn the truth, <laughs> right? Like maybe we need people to repeat studies and get that same negative result 10 times so that we can be really sure about something, you know? So that's the second bullet point here. Like novelty and positive results are, are vital for publishability, but not necessarily for truth, right? Like what is it that we want to know? And so when I think about this and I think about our job as STEM educators is to prepare the next generation of scientists, like to prepare people for careers in science. And I, and I know we talked about this lot, um, yesterday too, but you know, is it about replicating dysfunctional systems that we already have so that we can worry about our students being able to get ahead? Or do we have some role in disrupting the systems, dis disrupting what happens on the planet in terms of how science is done how science education is done so that we aren't just replicating. And, and so that's why I'm sort of, you know, proposing this idea of, of, of a pedagogy of open science where we teach students the values, the, the practices, and even the challenges that come, that come with opening up scientific work. I experimented this, with this a bit in my animal behavior course a while back. And, um, you know, and the idea is that you're not like pretending like this is the only science out there. I'm going to teach you that this is how science is done and nothing else exists, right? Like, I think we need to teach them in tandem and say, this is how science is done. This is how publication happens. This is how people, but there's this other world. There's this other way of thinking about this. There's this other group of people that are doing this. Can we not teach them in tandem? Can we not teach students the values and the practices? And, and as we're going along, have them think about some of the advantages of this because who's going to be going out there to shift how things are in the world? Isn't that why we're educators? Is that we want to create people that can be transformers of society, not just replicators of society, and especially true in STEM. This, this diagram is thinking about open education more holistically in, in this uh, ecosystem portrayal of the energy flow and nutrient cycling of the open education ecosystem. And so I put this up here because open science, you know, it, it doesn't exist separately. Open pedagogy, it doesn't exist separately. OER, open data, they all depend on each other. You know, we use data to drive our pedagogical processes and we can teach about open science and we can use open source software. And I think that it's behoven upon us, especially as STEM educators, to teach about this, this holistic ecosystem and the way in which it can drive our systems of education to be different and therefore our processes of how we approach science to be different. Um, and, and, and these are just some small examples of people who have done some things. And this, um, the idea of using open data to address critical questions, it doesn't even have to just be STEM educators. This is an example of people using an open data set, public art installations in the city of Baltimore, and looking at like which art, which art installations exist where, in which neighborhoods, and why, and who benefits. Like, there's a lot of questions that can come out of looking at data sets that are just these these raw pieces of data. Um, and um, the uh, the idea of really questioning data. So one of the reasons to teach about open data and data is to ask these critical questions, like who gets counted in our data sets? Who's missing when we're talking about gun violence? Like, <laughs> what about datafication? Is, is data-driven decision-making 
benefiting the public or amplifying inequities? How is data being used? So when we're when we're teaching about open science or open data, we can teach it in a critical framework. And I think that we need to, along the lines of what we talked about yesterday of rightful presence, do we just teach, here's how you do a t-test, here's how you do data analysis, this is how you test a hypothesis, but how about how is data actually used by others to sometimes make arguments that benefit themselves and that and they're actually skew, how could we skew the a portrayal of this data to make a different kind of argument, you know, and why do people do that? I think that's an important thing that we could be teaching about. Um, surveillance capitalism and the data economy. How is our data used? Who has control over data? Who's profiting? And especially in the age of AI, like what, what, what's happening? What's going on? We need to be thinking about how we teach our STEM students about this. And even in community colleges, we can raise these questions. I think we can raise questions and talk about what open science is without getting fired because we're also teaching in parallel all of the other stuff that we're supposed to be teaching. And you can all like um, uh, push back on that. Maybe maybe we can. Um, and this, uh, whoops, this quote here, um, what if we imagine teaching data as a place to start creating the connected collective caring world that we wanna see? I, I love this. This is by Catherine D'Ignacio and Lauren Klein. Um, in their book uh, called From Data Feminism. And they have, um, you know, teaching data like an intersectional feminist. It's, it's, it's a really cool, it's a really cool book. And I think um, this idea that we can teach about science, we can teach science itself in this integrated way so that we're, we're teaching way more than just those science principles themselves. Um, and uh, Brian, I haven't let you talk much. I'm gonna let you take this slide. Yeah, I'll, I'll just be quick about it because um, yeah, no. I had an emergency dean's meeting that's going to come up for me in three minutes, so I might have to pop out. Um, you brought up surveillance capitalism and and uh, and kind of you know talking about things like t-tests and stuff not in a vacuum. And perhaps maybe for me, one of the good things now is there's so many opportunities now out there to do that to think about how data is used. Um, you know, one of my favorite websites is Data for Black Lives. Um. Mm -hmm. And, and just to give you a very, very specific example, um, there's a really interesting study that showed that um, that like white people and black people were actually at equal risk of being stopped by police. But if if the interaction escalates to like, you know, show me an ID or something, black people are at a higher risk of actually getting shot. So the the, the probability of it turning lethal actually is at a different point, right? And so that opens up just a different discussion because some people will push back and say, well, you know, it's more of this and more of that. Um, where I saw this study was a lot more elegantly described than I just did, but there are just several places. You look at Raj Chetty's work from Harvard on the, the, um, the opportunity project that looks at using census data and tax data, um, the, 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 predictive, uh, the predictive nature of zip codes, the way you grew up, and what that means for your life, like your life outcomes in the American dream. Just so much ways to look at that. One more book I want to throw in there. Um, it's a little dated now, but it's still a classic in my opinion. Um, Weapons of Mass Destruction, M-A-T-H. Talk about surveillance and talk about using algorithms and, and data for nefarious purposes. Um, Kathy breaks it down um, perfectly. So anyway, I'll stop there and I'll have to say an early goodbye. Okay, and I'm just typing in the chat that Brian's going to share the citations for all of the resources. I will, I, I will. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Um, and in this slide, I think obviously you've read it, you know it, you know, data is not ideologically neutral, science isn't ideologically neutral, education isn't ideologically neutral, and yet we sort of pretend like it is, especially when we teach science, like we say, that we're being unbiased. We say that it's neutral and and, and it, it never really is. So um, I think uh, I wanted to just have us grapple with these two questions that I can also just put in the chat. Um, you know, how do we teach science in ways that promote traditional models of the successful, of the successful scientist right now? And how might we do it differently and is it possible to teach about open science in all of its complexity that I mentioned 
alongside our traditional ways, as I was suggesting. So, so those are my two, um, those are my two uh, questions, and I'm happy to uh, just sort of um, take whatever uh, comments or feedback or questions or any other <laughs> things that y'all want to say or talk about um, as a as a jumping off point here. So I don't mind um, talking about the first question again from a chemistry standpoint. I'm Courtney, pronouns are she, her. Um, so we promote traditional models because we don't let students show their creativity until kind of late in the curriculum of, uh, and again, speaking specifically for chemistry. And so I teach Gen Chem Lab and I teach organic. And I've just reached the point towards the end of organic too where students get to be creative, where I say, okay, here's a problem. Like, yeah, like, yeah, yesterday was a class I had. Um, and I said to them, I was like, okay, I want you to synthesize this compound. And I forgot to specify they had to use the reaction we had just talked about. So someone was like, oh, I have a solution. And they're like, it's this. And I was like, you're not wrong. That's not what I meant. I should have been clear about how I wanted you to get there, but you're not wrong. And it was like, okay, but this is the first time they actually get to show creativity and using what we've been talking about and doing the part of like being a researcher is grabbing knowledge, you know, from wherever by looking it up and then seeing if it applies to your thing. And like, we didn't use SciFinder because I was not teaching them that, but like, that's the end of, we're in the last three days of Orgo 2. And it's like, so there's, if this would have been an academic year, that would have been two years before I finally asked them, be huh. creative as scientists. And at that point, you've been kicked out from how strict the traditional route is. And so um, how can we do it differently? I, I love the idea of having students do like, how does chemistry apply to you in this world? But we are still heavily restricted by ACS, again, speaking specifically for chemistry, about how we teach and what needs to be taught. And as much as they have that new general chemistry performance evaluation um, standards, I think most schools don't even know they exist. And it is hard to, it's, I don't know how you get creativity from students who don't understand the basics and the principles. And I also think it's a waste of time to make them recreate like the Millikan oil or whoever the oil drop experiment was. I don't even know who it was anymore because I don't care. Like somebody did it. I know what I need to know from it. So yeah, that's, um, I don't have an idea of how we do it differently, but I like the idea of trying to be like, bring in somebody, no, somebody did bring in, Rissa, were you there? I don't know if you were there. It was like, bring in something from like the grocery store and let's look up the chemical ingredients and decide is like a banana like would you eat a banana if you were told the ingredients were this i love that that's a great thing i don't have time to put it in but it's a great thing so uh, yeah it's, it's kind of too bad like we have these like external mandates about what the priorities in learning are you know like you must learn this 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 you don't have time to be creative until you learn all this stuff and I don't even know if it's about creativity. I think it's more about um, how we're questioning. You know, like to me, the hallmark of learning science is being skeptical. Like, what is it that we know? What don't we know? How do we know that to be true? And, you know, maybe it's my, um, you know, idealism that hopes that we can te teach some critique about how, how do we, how do organic scientists even come to know what they know, you know, like how was that information acquired? Who who was involved in in that process? And um, you know, what are the ways in which those biases may have been present there? And how are we how are we amplifying them? And I hear what you're saying. I don't have time to teach about that because I have to teach about this. And this and this goes back to who creates these structures? You know, how how is it that we make strong calls for? Um, equity in science, and yet we're not really addressing the systemic issues that lead to those inequities in the ways that we teach science. So, I, you know, maybe I'm not having a good answer to the question, but um, it's, it's the same challenge, I think, for sure. Okay, if anybody else wants to jump in and... Brian, you're just in time. <laughs> Thank you for coming back. <laughs> I hope that deep. No problem. <laughs> yeah, it, it was a stupid thing that I didn't need to be there for. They told me I had to be there for, but 
I reminded them I did. Anyway, point is, I, I got out of it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, well, Courtney just shared how um, it can be difficult to, you know, deviate from the curriculum when you have a certain set of things that you have to teach within organic chemistry, for example. There's not a lot of time for students to be able to be creative or to go into different kinds of directions and, you know, a little bit related to what we talked about yesterday, but. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, my, my response to that, um, and this is not directly directed at Courtney in particular, but no. I mean, it's a common issue that I think comes up when people say come to sessions like this and feel somewhat inspired, but then you then you in your next breath, you think about the limitations back at home, right? And this is where I'll reiterate the role of chairs and deans to create an environment that allows people to at least give it a shot, right? So I mean, you know, from a systemic change standpoint, from a change theory standpoint, what you want is you want a couple instructors who you give the freedom to say, you know what? We have four sections of chem. These two sections, they went to this workshop and learned this awesome stuff. We're not gonna just revamp the whole ecosystem all at once. We're gonna kind of pilot it with these two sections have a robust assessment model, collect some data, take a look at it, reflect on it, what, would, what do we learn from it? And when the time is appropriate, have discussions about scaling, right? So mm -hmm. I think even with all of the doing the system down type rhetoric that you and I have at times, I think even with the fire, there's actually a systemic way to put, <laughs> it's almost a controlled mm -hmm. fire in Pangolin eco ecosystems, right? There's, there's a way you do it, and you, you, you do it in ways that make sense and makes a case for it as you go. Um, so I, Courtney, you may not be in that situation right now, but I guess what I'm saying is that is from a broad scheme of things is how I would you know recommend such a thing to happen. Well, so one, my point was more that students don't get to be creative until very late in the curriculum. And so by then, yeah. are fun. but to that point, um, the yeah. danger of that is that that's a small school luxury, right? Like if I, at my institution, we have, I mean, it might not even that big, but if you have two, three, four, five sections, and two of them are doing something pe drastically pedagogically different, and mm -hmm. students didn't get to pick which section they are in, mm -hmm. you now have that, like, you have a you have an issue on your hands. People are gonna be pissed, especially if mm -hmm. grades are different. People are gonna be mm -hmm. pissed. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's gonna be, and then it's also the, are you forcing other instructors to do that? And what happened to their pedagogical freedom, whatever. So I'm like, mm -hmm. I find that if I'm going to pilot something, summer is the best time because typically I'm the only instructor. So it's like, if you signed up for this, you didn't have a choice. So I, you don't, you can't complain that you wanted to be in the other section or da da da, right. and you don't have to deal with that because I think that is as much as I love that idea, especially because then you can do a direct comparison. It is mm -hmm. very tough if you, unless you can have everybody doing one thing because the students will talk and right it's always a problem. Right. And that goes into evals. And for teaching faculty like me, now my right. evals are trash because somebody else decided to right. innovate. I decided to innovate and the students didn't like it because it didn't go perfectly. And right. now my job's at risk because of experimentation, right? So. Right. So I 100% I agree. The only thing I'll add to what you're saying is part of what I said in my response was it has to be supported by the department administration. That's the key thing. So if it's just a you thing and then you sort of put all these things at risk, yeah, everything becomes sort of fair game. And I, I get what you're saying. But if if there's a conversation with a chair, a dean who says, hey, this section is going to try this stuff. Here's the evidence for what kind of happens. Sometimes the students don't like it. Sometimes the vows go down. You know, it, 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 we think it will because the scholarship mm -hmm. suggests it will, but it also may not. Are you prepared to take that risk as a dean? I'm with you, Courtney. I've seen situations where deans have been 100% supportive. And even when the students rioted or there was some pushback, the dean said, no, I have your back. I get what you're doing. But I've seen situations where, as you described, it wasn't properly structured. And then when the students rioted, the, the instructor was then left hung, hung out to dry. And, and that's why all of this, so much of this comes back to so yeah. those persons who have that power level. If you can support your, especially teaching faculty in that powerful way, it makes all the difference. I, I where, where I was lucky, I mean, I wasn't at a small place, but where I was lucky was that what we were doing, it actually worked and the students started to talk and what they were pissed at, they were pissed at there were only like 165 students in one section having this awesome time and the rest of them getting stuff flung at them and crashing their throats. They were pissed at that. So that created sort of a different kind of problem. So I think all the things you're saying, you're 100% spot on and that's, 
that's why it's almost as though we're talking to, to your bosses, right? You will say, yeah. yeah, you have a chance to really do this right, but it has to, you have to support it at your level. This You can't put it on court. Right? Yeah, but I at think the same I, time, I, all of my promotion and reappointment is voted on by my colleagues. So if I do that and mm -hmm. students riot and they get pissed, it's not even like my chair can be supportive and my dean can be supportive. Mm -hmm. But when they get in that private meeting to say, should she get promoted? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a, a of, different game a altogether. That's a vote. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of levels to that. Like, what does it mean to build a faculty community that supports each other in the risks that we take? I think, you know, I know we tried to do that at Dean State and it's not always easy. And I also say, like, I don't think we can faculty, faculty development our way out of systemic problems. Like, mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. not entirely up to the faculty or each individual faculty member. So I hear what you're saying, Courtney. Like, yeah, our colleagues can be worse than our deans in some cases. I've seen that happen. And so how do we build institutional culture? How do we shift faculty culture? That's that's a lot of it. But like be, before we even get to trying to do something that big, I guess my question is, can't we have some conversations with our students embedded inside of the curriculum that we're already handed to us, right, to say, oh, and there are scientists that share some of this openly. Oh, and yes, there are people that have actually published this in an open access journal. What's that, Dr. C? You know, like, oh, and then there are people that have, like, so that we're kind of trying to teach the idea that this stuff is happening out there, you know, like that we often, the, the most of the open science movement, like 99% of it is being driven by re researchers, by postdocs and principal investigators and research labs and not by educators, you know, and so they're trying to unlearn everything they learned about how to be a scientist and trying to relearn it now. And so um, I, I'm not saying that any one of us in this same room can individually make all of these changes, but at, but at what level do we at least agree that would be a good idea? I wish I could do that. Like if we could get a critical mass of people across institutions saying, yeah, actually embedding a little bit of information about what open, open science is and how it could benefit people could that be a piece that the American Chemical Association would take on as a priority when we're shifting what we say our standards are? And, and you know, there's no, you know, just add three things and, and do it. But I'm partly I'm wondering whether you think it's a good idea. Like if, if like, what do y'all think about open science? I, I read that article yesterday and it was pretty depressing because I was like, oh, open science, that's so cool. And then you read it and you were like, oh God, all the problems or other problems creep up and stuff. Um, so I, I don't, I teach about it. Um, maybe I could do more. Um, but I also am at a community college where we don't really have access to all the sciences behind paywalls and library subscriptions and things like that. That's why using the open science articles is something. Yes. That so, um, but it, it really caught, I don't know. I'm still thinking about it, but it really was kind of a damp <laughs> to read that article yesterday. And I don't really know how. <laughs> I'm sorry about know. that. Yeah. That's okay. I, I think it's really good to realize that even that has a ton of problems, but I just haven't digested it enough to even think about how to go forward. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's a fair point, like um, to say, yes, there's possibilities and some infrastructure for open for science to be more open and yet those that have more resources are going to be the ones that benefit from it more so where are we have we really gotten anywhere mm -hmm. but I still feel like there's more possibility right the more that people have platforms for their voices to be heard maybe there's just a little bit more possibility yeah but, um, yeah again everything comes down to 
the will of people and their goals, right? It seems like a lot of was all the DEI work really comes down on whether the people in power are willing to lean out until we achieve some kind of more level playing field. And mm -hmm. if they're not, then even something like open science can be co-opted <laughs> into another power structure. Yeah. So I don't know. But that's also, you know, a really deep ask, right? Like, what is, what, what is the reality that, that people would be willing to lean out a little bit and make space for others? Especially in a system that maybe not at the community college, but that at the R ones and so on, very much um, prioritizes research and, you know, how many, how many times your publication has been cited, all of that kind of stuff, how many grants you get over anything else, really, in terms of promotion and tenure and those kinds of things. And I think that, um, you know, I think that paper raises some really good critiques, but it, it doesn't erase the fact that the ability for people to put work out openly has often advantaged people as well. And people have speculated, you know, if Rosalind Franklin had openly published her crystallography data, maybe she would have gotten the Nobel Prize as well. You know, they weren't, they weren't able to just say, oh, let's just take this data that this other person generated and act like we had it ourselves and get a Nobel, you know, Watson and Crick. Like, so uh, th those, those are the kinds of examples. Like you can't say that this data came from nowhere or just some, uh, because Rosalyn had it on her website, you know? So the, the, the point is that it's supposed to make it a little bit more challenging for people to, to steal data when it's transparent as to who that data belonged to, to begin with, you know, but, that's maybe that's too optimistic. Any, anybody else? Rissa, you haven't had you haven't said much uncharacteristically. I was trying to say less. <laughs> I I love open science. I am currently at the point where as a PhD candidate. I'm, I'm, uh, I have a problem because my advisor uh, has very specific journals in mind, which have very high open access fees. And every journal that I've pitched that has a lower open access fee that has like diamond open access, she's like, no. Mm -hmm. And so, and yeah. I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place. Uh, I can't. I can't afford $4,000 for an open access fee. Um, but antithetical to the whole point of it too. Right. And so, uh, it, but you know, with each of those, I could publish it on my website. Is that enough to get it out there? Is that open enough? What is open enough? What would be ideal is that you don't have to know me to know that I did this thing, but then I'm not going to spend $4,000 on this, right? Like it just, I feel like it. it's yeah. constantly between a rock and a hard place. Yes, the idea is fantastic. No, the ability to do it is not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and again, I think the, I think the, the thing that I'm suggesting the most is that we teach our undergraduates the possibility of its existence. You know, it's kind of like what we do as educators. We teach possibilities and we sort of hope some of them someday figure it out. <laughs> you know, like, oh, there is this thing. For sure. Absolutely. And, and also, you know, I like the idea of there are free blogs, there are free websites out there. Go get yourself one and start cataloging what you're doing if you're willing to be open about it or even do it pri privately so that you can kind of have a record of what you're doing for you. But also, like, I mean, 
I don't know. I at one point I was like, eh, it doesn't matter if it's on my website or whatever because I have social media connections. Well, Twitter killed that. So now I don't have nearly as much social capital in that forum as I did. And not that it really went away, but I'm no longer connected with those folks in a large ability. So then it's like, how does the open science happen if you don't have common forums to be able to talk about it? And I do, I do think some of those open platforms like um, the Open Science MOOC and the uh, OpenLabNotebooks.org, uh, there's Protocols.io, they, they have uh, discussion platforms embedded in them where they're talking specifically about the science. Uh, I, Irene, I'm wondering if you wanted to add anything here as having had a chance to speak. Oh, oh um, my stem is different. <laughs> I'm, I'm a storyteller, uh, so slightly different. So I, I was just wondering that when you're getting um, the systems or the institutions to accept some of the changes that you're making, if you can make them you can humanize them uh, because I know that we've had a lot of uh, steps or, or a lot of mileage when we we talk from the human side uh, in in a lot of the things that we did, even if they were not in education. We made people understand how they're going to benefit from it or how they don't, um, if it's hurting them. Uh, we made them understand how um, the other side thinks about it and in a positive or negative way, but we didn't make anyone um, the bad person, but we just wanted people to understand where we were coming from. I'm talking from a point where I'm sure you, you do know that um, HIV was really big. It's still big in Africa. It's just that funding went down, so nobody talks about it anymore. But that's one of the points that I start because if you if you teach people why something is important or how it affects them directly or indirectly, then people understand it from a totally different human perspective. So I don't know if it's possible for whatever you do with your institutions to to start from that heart part, you know, where the heart beats. So then you can get it to, you know, to to the other side where they accept the policies or they accept the strategies or they accept to change whatever it is that is going on. So thank you, thank you. No, oh, thank you. I think I think that's a, an excellent point. You know, I think that's one of our, our challenges as science educators is getting our students to see the relevance of the things that we're teaching them alongside all of those facts and balancing equations and generating chemicals from different chemicals like how is this relevant to my life how is this going to impact humanity and i think i think science educators have actually done a little bit of a better job with that within our curriculum over the last um, number of years than we had in the past i'm not saying they're perfect at it um but but do we do that equitably? You know, making making science relevant for who is always a good question. Any other, any other thoughts or hmm. what do you think, Brian? Maybe he's lost his connection a little bit there. Yes, it's me, Rissa. Yeah, I've I've had some weird connectivity issues <laughs> as well. <laughs> so the video for this will be lots of fun. Um, I think I'm gonna stop recording and see what Brian, oh, well, Brian's back on. We should ask Brian and then we should stop recording.
Hmm? Ask me what. Um, we were just talking a little bit about some of the points that Irene made about um, humanizing our work as scientists, um, making it feel like um, it's relevant. Uh, and maybe I'm going to paraphrase you inaccurately, Irene, so please correct me if I'm wrong, but the ways in which we understand science to operate for, for people's benefit, as opposed to perhaps just private benefits or corporate benefits, is is a challenge for us in the sciences and how we're teaching mm -hmm. students, not just how do you advance your career to become a superstar so you can make a lot of money and work for this right. company that takes advantage of all these other people, like is that our goal? How, how do we teach more about the humanizing ways in which science could actually do what its ideal is, which is what I was told as a young science student, you know, you wanna bring knowledge to make lives better for other people, um, you know. Yeah, so I mean, I have a couple of comments to that. Um, there's, there's actually two big issues, I think. Um, well, two big challenges, perhaps, with, with, with that, um, that thought. One is, it, it gets into a why do we do science conversation? And there are certain basic science uh, projects and, and studies that have a very clear applied benefit, like making a vaccine you know, uh, building faster cars, you know, you know, pick your poison here, right? But there are some who will research something and study something, you know, purely just to understand how it works better and how the world works better and don't necessarily feel the need to, to kind of uh, justify or make clear that this thing I'm studying is going to turn into a very clear social benefit somewhere down the road. You know, some of those things have, but it's not necessarily because of the intent of the original investigator, right? And so that's a very, a fairly high level philosophical argument that, um, that I, I'm not picking a side here. I'm just sort of putting it out there, right? That I, I, I'm, with, I'm with Irene that I think you, you can talk about it both ways, but I just want to make sure you understand the, the other way exists. The, the, the second high level issue I think is um, the post-World War II model of scientific research really made the basic scientific science researcher a rock star and you know damn near untouchable especially as constructed through the tenure system so to Courtney's point you know, all of these you know structures were sort of put in place that incentivize and valued your scientific knowledge over all else like I don't know your ability to teach a class and so thus you know as a capital system goes people gravitated and not just their individual behaviors but their institutional behaviors towards you know, elevating that, right? Go to, go to campus, a campus that are not community <laughs> colleges, what do they tell you? We're trying to get R1 status. Why? I don't know. We want to get R1 status, right? So it became a thing, the, the you know, proverbial, uh, 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 you know, wild rabbit that everybody was chasing. And so, so because of that, there, there was some, there was and are really powerful economic incentives to make it about yourself. Right, research faculty get paid tens of thousands of dollars more than teaching faculty. You know, we have the data, we, the, 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 the capital um, of, of research faculty on a campus and nationally is way higher than teaching faculty. Um, research faculty get poached and, 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 you know, from institutions to other, like that. I think I know of one case, uh, Kelly Hogan, and it happened from UNC to Duke, and that's rare. So it, and I know I, I am guilty of speaking at 30,000 feet a lot, but, but it's, it's because I worry that if, if we don't sort of recognize the bigger complex webs that, that surround these underground problems, then you can run up against a sense of defeatism that, well, if I do this, this will happen. And so therefore I can't do it. If I do this, that will happen. And, you know, and I, I understand the feeling um, and to sort of get at what happened at 30,000 feet, this is where people who actually have the power to operate at that level need to be part of the conversation while we continue to do the underground activism, right? Um, so to, to you know, answer the question more directly, yes, like we need to talk about it from a human perspective. This is, this is part of OER, this is a whole big movement called being human in STEM that looks at pedagogy in that space. I mean, there's, there are good things happening around that, right? But at the same time, we have to sort of attend to, you know, the, the this, the political and systemic indicators that drive the behavior that we're trying to solve. Great points.
Any other thoughts?